Let's, uh, let's open with a quick word of prayer. Lord, as we pause to come before you, we ask for your wisdom and your guidance as we talk about these difficult subjects, that you would grant us clarity where there is confusion, Lord, grace and mercy to one another as we seek understanding together, Lord. But above all else, we ask that you might reveal to us your truth and that we would live in light of it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so thank you guys for coming to uh, lesson seminar number five here on our justice, race, and the gospel. This one is titled Mark's Goes to Church, Critical Race Theory, Intersectionality, and Christianity. And if those terms don't mean much to you now, don't worry. We're going to get into the weeds on this. Of all of our seminars, this is probably the most narrow, at least of the, the other two I taught. This is going to be the one with the the least amount of Bible passages in it, but it's a very important topic to discuss nonetheless. A critical race theory, which I'll refer to as CRT throughout the rest of this lesson, is something that quite literally just about everybody is talking about. It is a major part of our cultural dialogue today, and it as we, as we go throughout this lesson, hopefully you'll see that whether or not you've ever heard about it before tonight, it is impacting just about every facet of American life, even life in the greater Western culture. And so I'll give you a few examples here of its importance. It was about a month ago, uh, President Trump signed uh, an executive order banning funding uh, for CRT, critical race theory, training with government contractors. Okay, so he, he put this, uh, he signed this executive order. He was asked about it in the first debate. Why are you banning racial sensitivity training? Why is that wrong? That was really a jaded, unfair question because that's not particularly what he banned. There are forms of racial sensitivity training that would not be critical race theory. And there are forms of it that would be. Those that were, he banned. Those that weren't, he, he certainly did not cut off funding to them. But whether or not you agree with the executive order, whether or not you like President Trump or not, has nothing to do with it. It's just that you might see that this is something that is going on on a national level, even influencing our current presidential election. Here's an article I just saw today. Just added this right before the seminar here. University of Kentucky segregated residential assistance training by race, sent white people to white accountability space. All right. You, if you read this article, the white RAs were sent to learn about why they have white privilege, how they are guilty, uh, X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. You won't really find the term critical race theory mentioned here, but this is a fruit of it. This is what critical race theory leads to. I'd be lying to you if I told you that the University of Kentucky is the only place this is happening. Critical race theory and all of its offshoots inform just about every humanities discipline and, and degree in the universities today. And that is true in secular universities and so-called Christian universities. Most Christian universities, unless they are actively pushing back against it, have adopted some of these tenets and are teaching them to our children. I'll give you an example here within the church. In 2019, the Southern Baptist Convention passed Resolution 9. Resolution 9 endorsed critical race theory and intersectionality as analytical tools that Christians can use. To be fair, they also denounced critical race theory and intersectionality as worldviews and said Christians can't do that, but they can use them as analytical tools. I've been around and around and around on this with different people at different times, and I'm not entirely sure how you do analysis without worldview. I'm not sure how you can say, well, we can't accept them as a worldview, but we can use their methods, their worldview, to do analysis. That's a distinction they were trying to make, and this created an absolute uproar within the Southern Baptist Convention, and there's been bloody fights throughout uh, the last year and a half, two years over this issue. Here's another example I read from this week from Christianity Astray, I'm sorry, Christianity Today. The shocking necessity of racist violence 
by Christina Barland Edmondson. And basically in this article, she argues that there are lots of forms that racism takes and that these, uh, these forms that they take are all ne necessarily violent. And she includes in there spiritual violence, emotional violence, intellectual violence, basically saying that if anybody disagrees with her, they're committing an act of violence against her views on race. And this is fully endorsed by Christianity Today. Carl Henry and Billy Graham would be turning over in their graves today if they knew everything that Christianity Today was publishing. It is not a reliable magazine anymore. It hasn't been actually for quite some time. But these are examples to show you that all of this is tied into this idea of critical race theory. It really is the very air we breathe in our culture today and just about every discussion we are having. It is a dominant force in our culture. And whether you recognize it or not, whether you've heard the term or not, you have been impacted by it. It's probably shaped your thinking somewhat. It's a lot like postmodernism or relativism. And in fact, they're organically united, and we won't get too much into how these ideas developed, but there's entire books on how these two have grown up together and reinforce one another. But the reality of the matter is, is you're either actively pushing back against this, completely ignorant of the discussion, or you've probably swallowed some of it and are using it without even realizing it. And we'll get a little bit more into that throughout the evening. But it, for those reasons, it really is an ideology that the church of Jesus Christ cannot ignore. This is the dominant way your neighbors, your family members, unbelievers, this is the dominant way they are being trained to think and reason about these issues. And as Christians, we need to be prepared to speak into those types of discussions. More importantly, we need to do so as Christians. Paul offers us this really sober warning uh, in Colossians 2.8. And I want this to sit on you for a moment. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. I was at a seminar a week, week and a half ago, uh, on this very topic, and the gentleman, Owen Strand, he's a professor at Midwestern Seminary, opened with this comment, and he's 100% right. Paul's warning here to the church in Colossae is that they would not be taken captive by worldly ways of thinking, worldly ideologies, worldly philosophical systems. And that's exactly what critical race theory is. It is a worldview that takes people captive. And in the biblical framework of being taken captive, that means you are being taken captive by Satan to hell. To put it as plainly as I can put it, people will embrace this and leave the faith. People will embrace this all the way to the fact that they are damned for eternity. It's no small issue. This isn't something the church can ignore. It binds people and brings them into eternal damnation. So this is not just some intellectual debate. This isn't just some let's hash it out and see who can be better at arguing. The, there are literally souls hanging in the balance. And I will go so far as to say that a large amount of the young kids in this generation, the generation before, and the generation who come, who grow up in the church and who leave the faith, have either left the faith because of this worldview or once they did, they adopted this worldview. Like this is the chief enemy of the Christian church in the West today. We need to take it seriously. Having said all that, maybe we should talk about what it actually is. What are critical theory, critical race theory, and intersectionality? I know these terms are complicated. We're gonna spend some time defining them, tracing their origins so that you can understand them. But for now, just understand, understand it this way. Critical theory is like the tree. It's the tree, the trunk. And critical race theory is like a branch that shoots off of that main trunk, and so is intersectionality. Right? They grow off of the main trunk of critical theory, which we will explain and expound upon. Let's talk about their origins first. Critical race theory, as I just said, is a subset of a larger school of thought 
known as critical theory. And this has lots of offshoots, some of which we won't uh, cover today. Sometimes it's pejoratively referred to as grievance studies the studies of how we're grieved in society. Sometimes it's referred to as cultural Marxism, sometimes neo-Marxism, sometimes just identity politics, or applied postmodernism, or reified postmodernism, or even just simple shorthand social justice in the popular way it's used today in what we covered in our first seminar. Now, critical theory is mainly an academic and scholarly movement but it has trickled down into society and has infected every single discipline that is taught in the university. And that was its intent. If we want to know where critical theory came from, Bradley Levinson, uh, in his book Beyond Critique, labels Karl Marx as the first true critical theorist. So he says, where did this all start, according to this man? This man is not a Christian, to my knowledge. He says, where did this critical theory start? Well, he says it started with Karl Marx. In other words, in the academic realm, it is absolutely not a secret whatsoever that critical theory and its various offshoots are Marxist. I know it's gotten some play in the media recently, but members of Black Lives Matter and, and whatnot have acknowledged that they are trained Marxists. Why do they say that? Because it's true. <laughs> because it, this is an offshoot of Karl Marx's work. And it takes, really does take a special kind of ignorance to argue against the historic injustice of, injustices of the West, which there are many, and say, because of those great injustices, we need to get rid of it, and then to say, well, well I'm going to replace it with the most deadliest ideology of the last century, which is Marxism. Killed over 100 million people. There's no question that this ideology is wicked, dark, and antichrist through and through. In the 1930s, so tracing this, in the 1930s, a group of sociologists and philosophers started the modern critical theory and cultural Marxism in Frankfurt, Germany. This became known as the Frankfurt School. So what happened is, is these guys, some of them were exiles from the USSR. They formed this group together in Frankfurt to figure out why was it that the communist utopia wasn't happening? Why wasn't that coming to fruition? And the problem, or the, the solution they pretty much settled on was that Marxism was primarily economic. It's primarily there to deal with the disparities in economics. Though so Marx addressed more than just that, its prime move in communism is the economy. The state will own the economy, and then it will dole out to everybody so it can have equal outcomes. And they said the real problem with why that hasn't taken root, specifically in the West, is because that type of thinking needs to be applied to cultural issues. It can't just be economics. If we want to overturn the West, as they put it, you need to address all of society, all of culture. That's why it was called cultural Marxism. Marxism applied to cultural issues. And within the Mar our Marxist framework, all of life really boils down to power and power distribution. And the solution to the unbalanced nature of power in any society or even in a family unit is to redistribute the power. Don't redistribute the wealth, redistribute power. And what needs to then be overturned is the Burgios, those who owned the means of production in Marxism, but those who owned the culture need to be overturned, and they need to be replaced with something better. All right, and Marx was right in some regards. And when Marx looked at, especially during the Industrial Revolution, some of the treatment of the working class was wicked. It was evil. But his solution was far worse, as history has demonstrated for us again and again. So what critical theory did was take Marx's concept, his grid work, or how I could put it, his analytical tools of the oppressed versus the oppressor, and applied that to everything, not just economics, and to attack the framework of society as a whole, attacking what you may have heard called the hegemony. Great term, not easy to say. The hegemony are the cultural or moral norms or assumed practices that oppress minorities of any stripe, whether that be ability, age, attractiveness, 
weight, skin color, height, sex, etc. Right? It's a never-ending, expanding list. Whatever is considered the ideal or the normal is naturally and intrinsically oppressive to anybody who is not that. So if ta being tall is more desirable than being short, which it certainly is, <laughs> I am naturally oppressive even if I don't do anything wrong because I am tall. You can apply that to weight, hair color, beauty, whatever. And it is. Right? This is the ever-expanding grievance studies in our universities. They're looking at whatever the minority is and how the assumed cultural norms are oppressive and therefore need to change. Those assumed norms are the hegemony. This is why being white is considered inherently oppressive because we are the assumed norm and anybody who's not that is oppressed. Whether or not there's anything actually wrong being done to them, it's, it's an evil. Of course, just like so many other worldviews, it's never consistently applied because they want to get to a point where their view is the hegemony and then it doesn't need to be overturned. Then they will reach the utopia. They were to achieve this, according to the Frankfurt School, through a long march through the institutions. Right, they wrote about this openly. How are we going to get Marxism to take over Western society? Another word for Western society, the older term was Christendom. Right, Christianity is one of those assumed norms that needs to be overturned. And they were going to do this through a long march through the institutions. And what that meant is, is they were going to take over the institutions of our society through cultural Marxism and change the way people think about these issues. And the institutions that they particularly focused on, you can think of, are the institutions that would historically wear robes, the robed institutions, whether that be the judges, the courts, lawyers, academics, professors, scholars, judges, pastors. This was their goal. They would change, they would change the West into a communist utopia by changing the culture first. So they took over schools, they took over courts. And there's no, there's no secret that one of the ways the cultural revolution has happened in America is not by passing legislation, but by taking over courts who would then legislate from the bench. They openly talked about this and they planned to overtake these institutions. And if we're historically honest with ourselves, they were right and they've been successful. The university, one of these robes institution is thoroughly Marxist and has no toleration whatsoever for anybody who disagrees with them. They took over the institutions to influence the coming generations, and they have largely been successful. In addition to this, progress only comes through conflict, and that conflict includes violence. Whatever it takes, society needs to be torn down, rebuilt, because it's systemically unjust, it needs to be torn down from the bottom or top to the bottom and rebuilt. And if that means violence, if that means a Bolshevik re re revolution, then we do the Bolshevik, Bolshevik, Bolshevik revolution. That is the origins of critical race theory, intersectionality, and all these things we're going to talk about. No, they're not today in this pure of a form, but this is where they come from. This is the tree that they grow off of. And critical race theory, as I said, has... Um, many offshoots, or critical theory, sorry, critical theory has many offshoots. Critical race theory, feminist studies, queer theory, black studies, intersectionality, gender studies. Uh, there's even now fat studies, like fat shame studies. It, it goes on and on and on and on. An endless amount of aggrieved classes. So I'll offer you this short definition here of critical theory. Critical theory divides the world into oppressed groups and their oppressors along lines of race, class, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, physical ability, age, weight, and a host of ident or other identity markers. Right, so it divides everybody up into these different groups to see how you are oppressed by the cultural norms of the day, whether or not anybody's actually done anything wrong to you. Just the mere existence of these is an injustice. And the goal, to summarize this, the goal of critical theory is to transform society and to liberate oppressed groups by deconstructing, 
ripping it apart, the hegem hegemonic narrative, which are stories used to justify oppression by majority groups within a society. So they have to, they have to deconstruct the hegemony because the hegemony will always, according to them, tell stories that justify for why things are. So they would look at Christianity and they say, well, you use the Bible to justify your white supremacy, to justify saying homosexuality is wrong, and all that really is is you exerting power to oppress others and then justifying it to yourself. And their goal is to upend that. And critical race theory, in relation to critical theory, is critical theory applied to race and society. So it's taking the framework of critical theory and applying it specifically to the discussion of race. How does this impact race in our world today? I know it's a lot to take in, and hopefully there's some bells going off in your head saying, oh, I see this everywhere. Once you start seeing it, you can't unsee it in our society. According to Neil Shenvey, he's a Christian who, who writes and has done extensive research on this, and I recommend his work to you wholeheartedly. He says, critical race theory has several key assertions. One, racism is a system of privileges. Now, racism is not primarily you hating somebody else or thinking they're less than you because of their race, but it's primarily a system of privileges. It's right at front and center of what we're talking about today. Racism is permanent. There's really nothing you can do. It is the sin, the number one sin, and we can never really be truly uh, free from it. We don't have to prove, for instance, that racism has happened. It is assumed in whatever situation we get into that racism is the fact. That's why when something happens between a white officer, even a non-white officer, and an African-American, you don't have to prove that racism happened because they just assume it. It's there. No questions asked. It's already there. Third, Racism is hidden in ideas like colorblindness. Right, colorblindness is a racist terminology. They say it's a story we tell ourselves to make us feel better about being white, and it's not really a true virtue. Again, it's, uh, you hear this in public all the time. Colorblindness is actually the problem, not the solution. The Bible says the exact opposite. We aren't to judge people by the color of their skin, for good or for ill. Next up, racism is best understood by people of color. In other words, if you are in one of those minority groups, you have special access to truth that nobody else has. Therefore, your interpretation of that cannot be challenged, and if anybody does, it's just a further sign of their racism. And finally, racism is a part of interlocking systems of oppression. It's just one way that we are oppressed. We've got this larger, scope. Now shifting just a second here, before we do that, any questions, clarifications I need to make? Okay, shifting just for a second here, what then is intersectionality? Well, intersectionality is the interconnected nature of social categorization such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. This, uh, this definition, I believe, is from, from the Oxford Dictionary. So basically, intersectionality recognizes that because there are multiple different minorities, there are multiple different categories that each one of us could fall into, that you have different categories that intersect, that show how you are discriminated against in a unique way. So a black man is a minority as a black, but not a minority as a man. A black woman is a minority as a woman and as a black. So it's different than just being a woman or just being black. They intersect, those two identities intersect. It gets even more complicated if she's lesbian, if she's fat, if she's whatever. They just keep mounting up the score higher and higher and higher. And the interesting thing about intersectionality, rewinding back to critical race theory, is that the, more the higher your score gets of being oppressed, the higher your status is for knowing truth and being able to speak truth into these situations. To put it another way, it benefits you in this worldview to be a minority and to be oppressed. 
you enter into this like hero victim status that is basically untouchable. And this explains why we have seen some of the strange things we've seen in our society the last couple years. This is how we have the phenomenon of Rachel Dolezal. Anybody remember this story? Rachel Dolezal, that's a very pixelated picture, <laughs> is a, a white woman, Caucasian, yet this is how you would see her today. Rachel Dolezal, after growing up in a white home in the middle of, I don't remember where, but she pretended to be black, identified as black, started acting as black to get ahead in her positions within the social justice movement, and even became uh, the head of a NAACP chapter. And she used her minority status as an oppressed black woman to get ahead. It benefited her to pretend that she was black until she was exposed as actually being her. Those of us who are trying to think about these things consistently will say, well, if you can identify as a female when you're not, why can't you identify as being black if you're not? That's basically what she was doing. Uh, there's another case of this just this year, I believe, or maybe early, late last year. Jessica Krug did the same thing. I believe she was a professor, so she got ahead. She got hired partly because she identified as being a black woman. Comes, it turns out that she was actually a white Jewish woman. She was lying about it the whole time. So when we talk about the history of racism in our culture, you recognize that if racism is as bad as they say it is, people aren't doing this. They're not pretending to be a minority to get ahead. Doesn't mean there ain't problems, there are, but this is a, this is a clear shift in everything else we've seen in our society. So that, that's an introduction into this. Now I want to dive a little bit deeper in here to look at what are the beliefs of critical theory and, and critical race theory? What are their, their core beliefs? First, there is what we've talked about a little bit here, is liberation from cultural ideas and norms. That everybody needs to be liberated from these things. Here's a quote from a couple authors in this field. Critical theory, especially the emotionally and sexually liberating work of Marcuse, who is a part of that Frankfurt School, provided the philosophical voice of the new left, concerned with the politics of psychological and cultural revolution. The new left preached a Marcusean sermon of political emancipation. So the goal here is to emancipate ourselves from these cultural ideas and norms, even if they're uh, co codified in law. And the most glaring example of this is uh, same-sex marriage. It was naturally oppressive, according to them, to limit marriage to, ma to one man and one woman. There are, because the, the argument goes that they can marry whoever they wanted. Well, the reality of the matter is, I can't marry whoever I wanted before that either. A gay person could have married someone of the opposite sex too if they want, or if, if they so desired to get the tax benefits. The law was impartial. It didn't say if you're gay, you can't get married. It just said you have to marry someone of the opposite sex. But that's not, that type of logic is just white supremacist thinking anyways. So I'll just leave it there. The death of the individual. And that's the next core th idea here. Your identity is inseparable from your group identity. In other words, you are not first and foremost you. Who I am as a person is probably even the wrong word here, but who I am primarily is either oppressed or oppressor. My identity markers are the primary identity of me, not me as an individual. So you are primarily your race, your, your, your sex, your sexual orientation, your religious beliefs, those are primarily who you are at your core, not you as an individual. It's rather you as related to other groups. This is why you can have the phenomenon of African-Americans who tend to be more conservative, people like Thomas Sowell or Clarence Thomas or Shelby Steele or Vody Bauckham, who will speak to these things and people will look them in the eye, even some white people will look them in the eye and tell them they're not black. 
because they've betrayed the group, because being black isn't even necessarily really about skin color. It's more about your relationship to the group as a whole. And if you don't toe the line, you get called nasty things like a coon or an Oreo or whatever. Next, oppression is primarily about he he hegemonic power. I'll get it right by the end of the night. The ability of the dominant group to impose its norms, values, and expectations on the rest of society. There is no, no moral neutrality. Again, you are either an oppressed or an oppressor. You don't get to claim innocence. You fall into one of the two categories automatically. So it doesn't really matter if your moral norms are righteous or unjust. They, if whatever they are, they are wrong. All members of a majority group, building off of that, are morally guilty. Just by mere existence of you being white or a man or a Christian or straight or whatever the preferred thing is, according to them, you are guilty. And what's really interesting is then you go back to these women who are white who are pretending to be black if it's never been clear to you before this year, it should be clear to you this year, there really are two different Americas and two different cultures in our country today. They just are. They're not really that compatible anymore. So to suggest that, that me, I'm a part of the majority, I think is laughable. Let's say I wasn't a pastor. Let's say I worked at a Fortune 500 company. Who would get fired more, or who would get fired quicker? Me, if I stood up and told them my beliefs about, sex, or about human sexuality, or a gay person who got up and told their beliefs about sexuality? Me, I'd get fired. I'm not really the majority when it comes to my beliefs. That's rather clear. But how they define being a member of a majority group, you're automatically morally guilty. You're from Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanik. By contrast, many critical race theorists and social scientists hold that racism is pervasive, systemic, and deeply ingrained. If we take that perspective, then no white member of society seems quite so innocent. You're all guilty, and really there's nothing you can do about it. You can't actually become not white. To achieve liberation, social justice is used to transform society. Social justice is the popular term for this critical theory. And the goal is to upend society from that systemic injustice to replace it with this social justice. And then we will reach the utopia that we've all been longing for. Uh, McC McClintlock writes this, working towards a celebration of diversity implies working for social justice. Social injustice takes many forms. It can be injustice based on a person's gender, race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, physical or mental ability or economic class. You need to remember that oppression here that we have to be liberated from is just differences and having moral norms. In pursuing social justice, other moral virtues are condemned. This worldview has a very clear morality, and that morality is, <laughs> is that everybody else is oppressive and needs to be overturned. So when you, have, when you look at virtues that you might not, or even actions that you might not think are that important, they can be labeled as a part of Oppression. So having gender roles in marriage. Gendering, gendering your kids at birth, saying this is a boy or this is a girl. is a form of oppression. Coloring your nursery to match those color, the, those, that sex is considered a form of oppression. I actually, there was an article about this a year or so ago, I believe in the New York Times. Somebody wondering out loud about whether or not the gender reveal parties were just or unjust. I'm not making this stuff up. Ideas like modesty in the way we dressed are naturally oppressive. So are things like chastity, patience, and rationality. Right, so you see now that this worldview has started to attack both math and science. 
that math and science and rationality are considered a part of white supremacy as the West forces its worldview upon minority cultures. Whether or not uh, it's a, it's, it's absolutely insulting to say that minorities can't be rational. <laughs> you see how racist that actually is? Say, rationality is a white man's thing. So you're saying other people can't be right. Math's a, a white man's thing, science. It's, it's just a different form of racism to try to cure the country of racism. Building off of that, seeking ob objectivity and objective truth is also a form of oppression. And this is where we see the influence of relativism and postmodernism. Objectivity and absolute truth are male ways of thinking that we force upon you poor women. And you guys just can't really understand it. It's just, you don't need to because us men are being bigoted and just trying to keep you down. So free yourself from the man. We use that power of objectivity and logical thinking to maintain our status as men. So women that basically tells you, you can't be logical, but I'm the sexist. Those who occupy oppressed groups, as I've said already, have more access to truth. This is uh, what Vodi Bakum calls ethnic Gnosticism. That is, as being an oppressed group, you have special access to revealed truth. It is like God has come down out of heaven to tell you what no one else knows, and nobody can question it whatsoever. Therefore, to demand objective evidence or rational dialogue about these issues is wrong as it invalidates someone's lived experience. And it's just another way of us justifying our power. This, in part, is why it's almost impossible to have civil discussions today with people across this great divide. The other side really does think that when we try to discuss these things rationally, that you are being oppressive. That you are just trying to keep your privileged status. What then is this intersectionality? We'll dive a little bit, we'll remind you of the definition here. The interconnected nature of social categorization, such as race, class, and gender, as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating and overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. This term was coined by an African-American woman, Kimberly Crenshaw, in 1989 in some legal discourse. And what she was looking at was hiring practices and promotion practices of African-American women. And at that time, the law only recognized discrimination so that it could be punished in terms of race or sex. Right? So those are, the, those are the problems. But as she was going throughout her work, she found out that while a lot of these companies had done a good job of hiring black men, they hadn't hired black women. So she came up with this idea that there's this intersection between being a black female, that is a unique way to be discriminated against, different than being just, uh, or being a white female, or being a black man. And there's a sense in which, uh, I think we could say, that she was right. And there's a sense in which she was right in all of this, but what she created was this ever-expanding list of grieved classes and grieved identities. So today we have varying ideas or communities that overlap. So here's some graphics I found online about intersectionality. So there's you in the middle and all these different things make up who you are. These are the core of what it means to be Levi. And as far as discrimination goes, the intersectionality is like this Venn diagram here. Right, they, all of these different things, and we could get it even bigger if we wanted to, more categories, intersect into this very small corner there of how you are oppressed as an individual. Now I want to say, in this sense, intersectionality is correct. That classifying people only by race or sex is absolutely inadequate. And if you've been paying attention to the arguments that Joel and I have been making throughout this series, We've been trying to push you away from categorizing people this way for this very reason. 
And the problem is incidentals like skin color or your sex are not the primary way in which we should address one another. Well, it doesn't mean they don't exist at all. It just means they're not the primary forming of who you are. Now, granted, there are big differences between men and women. We don't want to downplay that. That's part of God's created order. But still, first and foremost, you're a human made in the image of God. But the problem is, is, as Crenshaw and her followers after that identified a legitimate problem within the law community, it just exploded and it made the problem worse because intersectionality furthers the problem by adding more categories. So get this. If the problem is that our categorizations are wrong, Kimberly Crenshaw comes in and says, well, what we need to do is then just add more categories. People who are more on the conservative side of the equation, and even more importantly than that, who are reading their Bibles well, recognize that the problem is those categorizations as primary at all. The problem isn't that we need to find more ways to categorize people and then add up this intersectionality score. The problem is, is we need to stop addressing people primarily by those things. You are not the sum of all of your parts. You are an individual made in the image of the infinite God. And even if you were to find perfectly matched intersectionality scores, let's say you had twins who grew up in the same house and they were the same score. They were, they were girls, black, lesbians, disabled, just add them all together. Even if you had those two people living up in the same house their entire lives, they would still be different individuals and they would even disagree on things and they would interpret what has happened to them in different ways because you are individuals made in the image of God, not groups gathered together by your various experiences and oppressions. To put it another way, there's infinite complexity in our fingerprints. We've all got individual fingerprints. From what I've been told, even twins actually have different fingerprints. So those crime shows that say they have the same, not true. They're different. And that's just your silly fingerprints. Not something as complicated as who you are in your soul, in your mind, in your thinking, in your reasoning. Yes, these things can influence how you're treated in the world, but the primary determiner of who you are as an individual isn't what happens to you, but how you process it and respond to it. This is why the Bible is constantly laying at your feet your individual responsibility before God. When Jesus says, when someone slaps you in the face, turn and give him the other cheek. Jesus is not playing the victim card. Oh, you've been victimized. Well, now you can do whatever you want. No, somebody wronged you, and God's still going to hold you accountable for how you interpret that and respond to it as an individual. And that's really the core difference here. I'll offer a very quick Christian critique of all of this. A simple compare and contrast. So hopefully through this you'll, you'll see how different all of this is. It's really a, a summary here. But primary identity between these two views. For critical theory, your primary identity is in your relationship to other groups. That's your primary identity. Wherever you fall on the intersexual spectrum. Christianity, your primary identity is found not in your relationship to other groups, but in your relationship to God. That is first and foremost. You're made in God's image. You're a sinner by nature and by choice. And hopefully the majority of us in this room are redeemed by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Those are your primary identity markers. Everything else is secondary. What is man's main problem? Critical theory. Our main problem is unequal power and oppression of the other. That is the original sin that must be dealt with. Christianity, our main problem is our individual sin before a holy God. Salvation will come differently between these two different categories. One through social revolution and the other through individual repentance and faith. I guess I just stepped on my own touchdown call here. Salvation, critical theory. How do we get to the good? 
redistribute power through changing society by any means necessary. Christianity, how is salvation uh, brought about? Repent of our sins and believe in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Salvation comes from the outside as God humbles himself, takes on the form of a man, and deals with our main problem, our individual sin. How do we come to know things? How do we come to knowledge? Critical theory says we come, knowledge comes through our lens of, and personal experience. Hence, oppressed groups have special revelation and special access to knowledge. So in critical theory, all knowledge is subjective, experiential. Christianity says, as image bearers, all people can reach some level of truth through reason and natural revelation. That is, God has revealed some truths. They're self-evident to us. And though, though our knowledge is limited because we are sinners, we are finite individuals. Divisions and hostilities. Critical theory says divisions will never really be overcome as it emphasizes differences in perceived grievances. The goal is to then overturn society to reach true equity, which I'm not really sure we can ever reach. Christianity says, or emphasizes man's double equality in Adam as image bearers and sinners. We've, we've covered this, but I really want you to, to see this. If you're ever dealing with reconciliation, whether you're trying to reconcile your kids or between you and your spouse or whatever, you're never going, like you can't ignore problems, but you're never going to bring reconciliation if all you do is emphasize the differences and the grievances. If your entire worldview of bringing change to society and bringing healing is to tell everybody how utterly different they are, have no common ground, and you're all oppressed or oppressors, the natural outcome of that is more division, more hostility, more hatred. I think this is one reason why we have seen, and we will see more of this in the coming years, um, more racial strife, especially people who are white going to white, back to white supremacy, is because if everything is primarily about my identities, white people will eventually start looking at their skin and go, well, if I'm white and you're not and we're completely different, I'm going to look out for my own. And it'll be wrong when they do that, but it'll just be another form of critical race theory going in the other direction. Ethics and morality. How do we term, determine what is right and wrong? Critical theory. There are different rules for different groups. Oppressed groups are allowed to do evil things because they are oppressed. Morality is subjective. So if you are an oppressed individual, uh, you can do things that an oppressor is not allowed to do because of your, your suffering. Christianity says God's eternal character is the universal unchanging standard by which everyone will be judged. This goes back to the principle Joel talked about and I talked about of impartiality. God's justice is impartial. It's a universal standard that everyone is held accountable to. Critical theory does apply different rules to different groups based upon who they are. That's a stated and explicit goal. Meta-narratives, this is the last one. Meta-narrative is just a, a word for universal stories, universal truths, universal stories. Critical theory rejects universal stories as evil tools used to oppress people. So Christianity is a meta-narrative. It tells the story of the whole world and says that everything falls under this. And if you do that, they say that that is an evil tool used to oppress individual. Instead, everybody has their own stories and they're all equally true. Christianity, uh, God tells us the meta narrative of the world in Scripture, which finds its pinnacle and its fulfillment in the person and the work of Christ Jesus. As you look at these two different worldviews, again, going back to uh, the Southern Baptist uh, Re Resolution 9, I don't see how. You can use this as an analytical tool without all of that baggage. It strains credibility to even suggest it in my mind. So here's my, here's my conclusion. On this. As you look at these two, hopefully you're seeing it as I'm seeing it at this point, that they're, they're not compatible. You can't bring them together. 
They're really at war with one another. Again, if you go back and read the actual authors on the side of the equation, they have no qualms whatsoever as lumping Christianity as an evil meta-narrative that needs to be overthrown and replaced. And as a pastor, um, I have the job of being a shepherd. Joel, Richard, myself, Pastor Lang, we have the, jo the job of being shepherds. And there's lots, lots that goes into that. But I want you to look at the words of Christ on this. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I laid down my life for the sheep. Being a real shepherd and not a hired hand includes binding up the, the weak, encouraging them, feeding the sheep. But it also includes this aspect, which we sometimes forget that Jesus is referencing here. It's beating off the wolves with the biggest stick you can find. The hired hand sees the wolf coming and says, this is going to cost me something. I'm getting out of here. And unfortunately, I think the Christian church in America has way too many hired hands and not enough under shepherds who recognize that there's a wolf out there and he wants to eat the sheep. You can't build a halfway house for the wolf. You have to take out the stick and chase him off, even if it offends, even if it's costly. The job of a shepherd is not to endorse the wolf, not to ignore him, not to be slothful or ignorant of his designs. To do those things is to be unworthy of the calling of a pastor. Rather, one of the primary jobs of the shepherd is to lay down his life for the sheep and stand between them and the wolves. And as I've said, generations, even individuals from this church who have walked away from the faith, this is what they are walking away to. Many of them. Some of them I know. And that's not okay. And it's the job of the pastor to say, no. Why are Joel and I spending six Sunday nights going through this? Because this is something that will ensnare and entrap and bring people to hell. I've watched it of individuals who've been here. I've watched it individuals I've known from school, individuals I've known online. And you, you start taking in this critical theory stuff and it may start with the race stuff, but then it all, always in today's world spreads to the sexuality stuff. All of a sudden, the church has got this long history of abusing homosexu homosexuals and we need to do whatever we can to apologize for that and to change our attitude. And what's really going to get changed is then the Bible's teaching on it, that homosexuality is wrong. And it's a cancer that spreads and undermines and destroys. So, I tell you here tonight, don't go that way. Open your Bible, read it. If you think Levi's off his rocker, open your Bible. Show me. I'm willing to be corrected on these things. Next. So instead of where we opened, on being taken captive by these hollow and deceptive philosophies, we are to take the world captive. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. What are these strongholds we're destroying? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So instead of you being taken captive by hollow and deceptive philosophies of this world, instead we are charged to go out there and to destroy their arguments and their lofty opinions and to take them captive. See the, the flip there? This is the dominant way of thinking in so much of our world today and you have to be aware of it lest you be taken captive by it. And part of the reason of teaching these things is so that we can pick up our big sticks and start beating the wolf as, <laughs> until it's a dead horse. Because this really is life or death, eternity hanging in the balance. There's a gospel of critical theory, and then there's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We dare not try to build a halfway house between the two. Because there isn't a halfway house. You will just be following a false god and a false gospel. 